message for today, I'd like to show you just a short video clip. <clears throat> so if you could dim the lights and turn that on. Thank you. Now that I have all of your valuable attention, because trust me, nobody likes texting and twittering and snap imaging as much as I do, I just want to take this opportunity to tell you how thankful I am for all of you. <coughs> I'm thankful for this meal, because nobody makes green bean casserole like your mama. <laughs> And I'm thankful for this family, watching you grow and follow your dreams. It's an honor to pray for each of you when I go to bed every night. And I'm thankful I can still chew my own food. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I'm not as thankful for the green bean casserole as this guy is. <laughs> but I am thankful. I'm thankful that God blessed me as a dad. All right, now that everybody saw that video and everybody had a good laugh and maybe even thought about a little tear at least, I did not cry at this one, I promise. But it did have a good message to it, right? <clears throat> Thank you. I've got some, in, some own admissions of people who started to have a tear. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Children are dismissed to Children's Church if they haven't already gone. And we're going to get started today. I hope that nobody's Thanksgivings looked like the beginning of that video clip. However, I must admit, it's, it's hard in today's culture and how we're so used to doing these things. And I found it quite funny though that the grandpa he obviously had that remote control next to him already he didn't get up from the table and go get it so he obviously was watching tv at the table wasn't he now maybe it was a big game but i think what's important is we're assuming he did turn off the game now i don't know if there was a big game this year i didn't watch any big game on thanksgiving day i'll admit it but here's the thing no big game? I missed out. The Bears won. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians 3.20 says this. Give thanks to God the Father for each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That video just had a, such a great ending and how it wrapped it up to make us realize we need to focus on having an attitude of gratitude and truly recognizing what we're thankful for. Now, I couldn't just skip over this day and not preach about being thankful. How thankful are we for each other? Do we really tell each other how thankful we are? How often do we talk about it? Do we share it? How often do we even say it at all? Too often we're too busy with our own everyday lives and we don't get around to just walking up to somebody, shaking their hand or giving them a big loving hug and just saying, you know what, I am so thankful that God blessed me with having you in my life. And now that I say that, and I'm looking across the congregation as well, 
I know it sounds a little bit awkward, doesn't it? But it's because we don't do it very often. Maybe we think, well, that doesn't sound manly to walk up and give somebody a big hug and say I'm thankful for them. But it is. <clears throat> it's a great thing. It's what we should be doing. We should be going face to face to each other and thanking them and telling them what we appreciate in them. Today we're talking about having an uh, attitude of gratitude. And I think that's something very needed in today's culture because we're so busy with our own desires, our own needs, our own wants that we forget to do these things. Every once in a while I think we may pat ourselves on the back as we do something good for somebody else. <coughs> Excuse me. But too often, even that's somewhat focused upon ourselves. Or we do something good for somebody, which is great, but then we pat ourselves on the back or we share it to Facebook or we call somebody up and say, guess what I just got to do? And in some cases, that is good. Don't be wrong, because it, it starts a, ser a series of events which allows other people to think, oh, I should do something nice for somebody else. So sometimes it's good, but it's not always good. But more important than this is how often do we thank God? There's a quote, let me show it to you here, by pastor, author, conference speaker Paul Tripp. It says this, give thanks not just for the physical blessings of God's provision, but for the spiritual riches he faithfully pours down on you every day. See, I do think that we're, we're pretty good about thanking God for his physical provision. God, thank you for this meal you're about to provide for us. May it nourish our bodies, may it give us strength, may it make us healthy. May we glorify you in all we do. God, thank you for this new car that you blessed me with. God, thank you for this new TV that we bought on Black Friday and the great deal to save money. I mean, we thank God all the time for our physical possessions. But how often do we really just thank him for the spiritual things that he gives us, the spiritual riches that he faithfully pours down upon us each and every single day? You see, maybe you do that too. <clears throat> But do you really do it with an attitude of gratitude where you are so grateful for it that you're just breaking out in tears and falling at it at God's feet? Your face in the ground as you truly recognize what you have and what other people do not have. You see, this isn't some new complex idea. This is the basics of our faith. This is what we should be doing each and every single day. It's nothing new. But here's the problem. Unlike the video we watched from the skit guys, by the way, that was the skit guys, a video called Attention to Thankfulness, if you want to look it up. Unlike that video, we don't always have a grandpa in our life to bring attention to the fact that we're not focusing on the things we should be focusing on. Sometimes we need a reminder of what we should be focusing on, and we do have something much better. It's should we ignore him. We have the Father God, and we have his word the Holy Word of God, and we have the Spirit within us. But too often God's Word is sitting on our nightstands covered in dust, or it's sitting in our glove box not being looked at. It's sitting on our dash aging in the sun so that it can look like we use it a lot. But we don't really just get it out every single day as we should to fully recognize all that God has blessed us in His spiritual riches. So, are you thankful? Today we're going to be in Psalm 100 and Psalm 148, and you're welcome to start turning there. The Psalms are a great place to go to, when you really need something to push you and motivate you it, to really be thankful for all that God has done. When you need something to lift your spirits, to help you to praise God, we can turn to the Psalms, and they really help to focus our attention where it rightfully should be. We're going to look at Psalm 100 and 148. But I also thought it would be good to read to you a piece of our American history, as we did just get done with Thanksgiving. Last week in your bulletins was an insert which had, had to do with the Thanksgiving proclamation. I just thought I'd read it to you today. I've got a, an excerpt from it here. The gracious gifts of the Most High God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. Abraham Lincoln. I'd like to take a moment. I know it will take a couple minutes, but I want to read the whole thing to you because 
Again, too often we skim through and we don't really read the whole thing. So there's a lot in here. So let me read this to you. This is the proclamation which set the precedent for the American our holiday of the National Day of Thanksgiving. This was during the Civil War days and sets the day apart as the day of thanksgiving and praise. <clears throat> I think it's important to realize as we read this that the Civil War was still going on at this, at this time. Let me read. Washington, D.C., October 3rd, 1863, by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. The year that is drawing towards us is close, has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are too prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added, which are, are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of the almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations. Order has been maintained. The laws have been respected and obeyed. And harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. While that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union, needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the na national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the mines, as well as iron and coal, as of the precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than here Two, four. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield. And the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increases of freedom. No human council has devised, nor has any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our benefic beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the inscriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, <clears throat> they do also with humble penitence for our national per perverseness and disobedience. Commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are all unavoidably engaged. And fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington this third day of October, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th by the President, Abraham Lincoln. The gracious gifts of the Most High God should be solemnly reverently and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. That was a lot to say. We don't speak like that anymore. We don't write like that anymore. So some of those words are quite mouthfuls to try and spit out and speak. But I think you get the point of it. This is the point. The gracious gifts of the Most High God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice 
by the whole American people. Even at the onset of this holiday of Thanksgiving, and I should say the official onset of this holiday, because this is officially when it went into existence, but almost 90 years beforehand, George Washington tried to put this into existence, and he didn't get, get it voted in. So it's not the first time, and that was, again, an official holiday stance. But even at the onset of this holiday, it was fully intended to honor and praise, to thank God for all that he blesses us with. Even with the condemnation of our own sin and how undeserving we are of mercy, God gives us that mercy that we don't deserve. He gives us life through his son, Jesus Christ. And yet we fail to recognize him. We fail to recognize this. Our forefathers created this holiday. To recognize this. I watched a movie this weekend with all the extra time I had about the Civil War. It wasn't a documentary, but it was based on a true event. And it was eye-opening. Not the first time I've seen Civil War movies, but it's eye-opening to see all they went through. And yet still, in all that tragedy and all that suffering, all that death, all that war, they still produce something like this in the middle of it. That right there is a life lesson for us of how we can thank God, how we can have an attitude of gratitude, even in the worst of times. Now, I understand that some of us, it's innocent. We're not trying not to be grateful for God. And we are being grateful for God. But maybe not as much as we should be. It's just we're so busy with travel, with family, with friends, with cooking and baking, the Thanksgiving food, with hunting. I should mention, it's great to see so many visitors here today. Uh, but here's the thing. All too often, we seem to be thankful for everything but God. We need to make sure that we're not so busy being thankful for the worldly things that we fail to be thankful for the spiritual things. Don't be so busy being thankful for the worldly things that you fail to be thankful for the spiritual things. Sometimes we need to go back to our roots, and we really need to think through what we should be thankful for. So I've given you plenty of time to open your Bibles to Psalm 100, and we're going to look to a great example, a great picture of having an attitude of gratitude. I don't have it on the screen for you today, but there are Bibles in front of you, and I'll read it to you. And if you're able, please stand as we read this together. In Psalm 100, we read this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever in his faithfulness to all generations. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, when I read this psalm, there's a, something I like to do, and maybe you do it as well. I like to actually start at the end as I study it. I like to work my way back up. But first, I want to point out to you one thing. I, again, I now wish I would have put it up on the board. But if you look down at your Bible, and I'll read it again, starting at the top, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. It's not a period. It's not a comma. What you notice is we have an exclamation mark. And it continues on. Serve the Lord with gladness. Exclamation mark again. Come into his presence with singing. Again. Exclamation mark. Know that the Lord, he is God. Exclamation mark. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, exclamation mark. Give thanks to him, bless his name, exclamation mark. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations, period. I think it's important to notice those exclamation marks as it tells us how we're supposed to be reading it. We're supposed to be reading it with excitement. 
and with energy and fully realizing the importance that this is. But again, I said I like to study it backwards. This psalm gives us great things to both notice and do. Good things. And if we read from the very end and we kind of go up, this is what we see. We see God, the Lord, is good. So we, we kind of get this intro of why are we doing all these things? Why are we making a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth? Why are we serving the Lord with gladness? Why are we coming into his presence with singing? Well, if you start studying that end, you see why. You see God, the Lord is good. And his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Now you just had Thanksgiving and many of us have been asked many times, whether it's around the Thanksgiving dinner, the turkey, or maybe it's just in casual conversation with people, what are you thankful for? And many of us did not do it. Many of us didn't participate in going through those routine, traditional sayings of what are you thankful for? And that's okay. It's not about that. But this message is about are we being thankful for God? Are we having an attitude of gratitude? We may be thankful for friends. For jobs, for money, for family. I'm just trying to think through some of the many things you might have said around the table. We're thankful for having houses over our heads, roof, roofs over our head. We're thankful for having heat in this building. I am at least because I hate cold. And yet I moved to Wisconsin. I'm learning to enjoy it, by the way. The hunting really helps. But I'm going to need to get out on the snowmobile this year. But all things and needed things to praise are nothing without praising God. We need to be praising God, but God. We need to remember God, but God. He is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Notice that when we're looking, when we're looking at that last part, his love endures forever. It's not just his love endures forever. It's his steadfast love endures forever. This is different than just regular, any form of love. This is steadfast love. This is a word which sets up the whole statement to help you realize that steadfast means immovable. His immovable love, enduring love, is forever. It does not change. It does not lessen in its strength. It does not become distant it's always close. It's always right there. The dictionary says to steadfast. That means firmly fixed in place. Immovable and not subject to change. It says it's loyal. God's love endures. And nothing can take it away. Nothing can make it fade. Psalm 63 tells us, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. It is because of all these things and more that we, let's go back to the beginning now, we make a joyful noise to the Lord. We make a joyful noise to the Lord with an exclamation mark. We're excited. We're energized to be able to do this. All because the Lord is good and his love, his steadfast love endures forever and ever and ever, and it's immovable. It does not change. It does not lessen. It does not become distant. His steadfast love, which endures forever, is firmly fixed in place, immovable, not subject to change. And when you look back to the beginning, now we see why we do all these things. We make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. We serve the Lord with gladness. We come into his presence with singing. And we know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture, and we are commanded here to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. All the earth, all the earth, this is interesting, all the earth, and it sounds very familiar to what we read in the Thanksgiving proclamation as Abraham Lincoln realized, despite the civil war, he invited all of Americans, all the nations to come together and to recognize this holiday, 
to praise and thank God our Father who has bestowed so many blessings upon us. We're not meant to praise God alone. We're meant to praise God together. As brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God, we're meant to lift our voices as one. Not be so busy fighting against each other that we're causing a hindrance to the gospel. A hindrance to this praise. God's looking down on us and saying, oh man, they're so busy debating and fighting at the Thanksgiving meal that they're not just thanking me for what I've given them this year. Let's flip over to Psalm 148, just for a few minutes. I want to read this to you. Psalm 148, we read this. Praise the Lord. Notice again all the exclamation marks throughout this word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he has commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all depths, deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, stock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. You know what's just to me just so powerful and amazing about this scripture? It's not just us that praise the Lord. It is all of God's creation which is praising him. Having an attitude of gratitude. They're having thankful hearts and recognizing that he is their creator. If nothing else... We praise him, we thank him, we have attitudes of gratitude because God created us. We have this whole possibility of life because of him. And all of his creation praises him. All of his creation is grateful and thankful and not just people. Did you hear some of that? Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels and the host. Praise him the sun and the moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise you, highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. You know, I, had, I love the teens here because they're so deep and they just love to study God's word. I love our Sunday school teachers here who guide them in the way of God's word. And just a couple weeks ago, when I was already planning this message, I had one of our Sunday school teachers came to me and they said, the teens have a question. What does this mean in Psalm 148, verse 4, when it says, Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Now, I looked it up about eight different commentaries. I gave her my opinion first, and it did line up with the different commentaries. But it's interesting just seeing... And what those commentaries say is one of two things. Either it's looking back to creation and how God created this firmament, firmament of water above the heavens to protect us. Some people say it's in relation to the ozone layer that protects us from the sun. Other people say that it's more basic and it's just saying, praise him for the waters above the heavens. And it's talking about the clouds which are filled with water and those clouds which provide for us. But... Well, the overwhelming context I get from these commentaries is this. All these things, how they praise God, isn't that they're lifting up their voices and singing like we do. They're praising God by just doing what they're commanded to do. They're praising God by living, if you would, living lives, acting in a way how they were created, living up to their purpose, living up to their expectations serving 
God in all they do. And we too can do that, as it says, not just make a joyful noise to all the earth, but it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Now, as we serve the Lord, we realize that serving here isn't just meaning with our hands, taking care of the fields. It's not just meaning with our hands as we help out a stranger on the street or as we invite somebody to Thanksgiving. We can serve God with how we worship him. Listen to this. Romans 12, 1 says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Our spiritual worship is presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to him, living for him. And as the, all God's creation worships him, praises him, just by living it up to their purpose, we too can praise him in that way. Well, I got ahead of myself. An attitude of gratitude. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Therefore, there's three major points here and straight from scripture as I try to do. Number one is praise him. Shout. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. And we can shout in many different ways. Sometimes we praise God. We shout out to him. We make a joyful noise to him in tears. That's okay. Sometimes we do it in laughter. Sometimes we do it with a joyous smile on our face. And we just can't get away. And our arms are lifted up. And God, you are amazing. I can't believe all you're doing for, it, for me. All those are great ways to make joyful noises to God. Sometimes... We're standing strong, proud, and excited and happy to be worshiping him, lift, praising him, lifting our voices high and making a shout. Other times our voices are in the sand. Our faces are in the sand. And that's okay too. There's many different ways that we can shout out to God, that we can lift our voices high, that we can praise him. But number two is serve him. Now remember... To serve God before you serve yourself. Did your mom or papa ever teach you to open the door for somebody else as you walk up? Did they ever teach you to serve others before you serve yourself? Maybe it's at the dinner table. I've been yelled at. The, well, I shouldn't say yelled at, but I've been corrected for this a few times. When somebody asks for the salt or the pepper, and you grab it, and what do you do? You shake a little on your food, then you pass it to them. That's not the right way to do it, I'm told. I'm told you're supposed to pass it to them. You serve others before you serve yourself. Where God's word tells us that his greatest commandment is that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and we should be making him number one. We need to serve him first. We need to lift our voices high to him first. Serve him with gladness too, not bitterness, but with praise, with all those exclamation marks. And number three is know him, remember him, and remember the truth. Don't allow Satan to use the world's lies to deceive you into thinking that God or God's word is just a made-up book with a bunch of fables, stories, poetry. God's word is real. And you can't just pick and choose. We need to know him. And we need to know him so well that we can truly have an attitude of gratitude. We can truly be thankful in a way which honors and glorifies him in all we do. Because if we know him, we know his words so well, we can't help but to have an attitude of gratitude because we're so grateful for all that he's blessed us with. Not just the physical possessions, but the spiritual riches. Now, before I end today's message, I thought I'd end with seven points. This isn't a new sermon. I'll read them real quick. Seven points on how to help you get through the holidays, how to help you get through Thanksgiving next year. And there are, again, biblical points. These were in an email I found. It's called Seven Suggestions for a Delightful Thanksgiving by Larry Tomsack. And it says this, number one, always start with prayer. This may seem obvious, but it's often overlooked. Prior to the upcoming family get-together, pray for God's favor and discernment so he can bring a blessing 
when you come together. If you're truly preparing, it's not just preparing the food. It's preparing for the get-together by starting with prayer. Number two, serve. Be intentional to embrace the heart of a servant rather than a, spec a spectator, a mere consumer. When Jesus gathered for his last supper with his friends, he washed their feet and reminded us in John 13, 15 to 17, I have given you an example. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Invest in those present by possibly helping with the dishes, clean up, or engaging with the children. That's a huge blessing, let me tell you, just helping with the kids. Number three, ask questions. Scripture teaches in Proverbs 25, the purpose in a man's heart, in the heart of a man, is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Accept people as they are and take a genuine interest in their lives. Imitate Jesus, who would be in the temple among teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. But number four kind of throws that all into a whirlwind as it says, be comfortable with silence. This one's convicting to me. Be comfortable with silence. There's no need to keep the motor running when there are pauses in conversation. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that, that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Number five, avoid arguments. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. 2 Timothy 2, 24. And I don't want that to get taken out of context. There are things that we need to address as Christians and as believers so we're not allowing people to continue down this road to hell and not having relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way that we even have life is through professing with our, with our mouth that Jesus is our Savior. He died upon the cross. He rose from the dead and he was victorious over sin. That's what gives us life. But there's a way to do it. And stimulating conversations can quickly take a wrong turn and can redirect, we can redirect the flow. Proverbs 17, 14 says, The beginning of strife is like letting out water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. Again, don't take that too far. Number six is reach out. In getting ready for a bountiful feast, do we do as Jesus instructed? When a man prepared a supper and some invited guests didn't come, Jesus said he should include the less fortunate and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Luke 14, 21. And number seven, the last point was this, show understanding. For those of us who are used to simply plopping down for a lavish gourmet offering during the holiday, we may not be aware of how much time and effort goes into the culinary spread. Our hosts literally invest days in planning and preparation for this special day. And it sure doesn't honor them to or help them maintain composure when hungry participants add stress with annoying inquiries or failures to come when called. Think how much tension can be eradicated by following God's wisdom in Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. 99% of our stress inducers can vanish by putting this verse into practice. By really making this our life verse. Reading, reading it each and every single day. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let us all embrace this this thing this time of year this holiday time of year with christmas coming now and a holiday brunch still maybe these are some good reminders to you not all quarrels or fights are needed fights or good fights but how do we praise god how do we lift up our voices loud and shout to him we praise him we serve him we know him we remember him and remember the truth and just how all creation praises him by just doing what they're created to do, we too can have an attitude of gratitude, 
we can be thankful for what we have by living up to God's expectations for us, for doing what we're created to do. We were created to have a relationship with him. We were created to praise him and honor him and glorify him with our lives, to serve him. He doesn't need us to serve him, but he desires us to. Let's do that today. I'm going to pray as the worship band comes up to close us in a final song. And I'll also pray for the food. Please join us for the brunch. Let me pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for this day. We're thankful for the wonderful holiday that we had in Thanksgiving. But may we recognize that it's not just a worldly holiday. It's, it's something that your scripture commands us to do. We are to be thankful. We are to live with an attitude of gratitude. And we should be living gratefully for all the spiritual blessings and the physical blessings that you bestow upon us. May we not forget to honor and glorify you, to thank you first, and to live for you, loving you with all of our heart, 